pleasure of introducing her now. So Dr. Marav Bin David um, got her undergraduate and master's degree at Tel Aviv University, and then moved all the way over to Alaska to get her PhD at University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, she has been a professor in wildlife biology at University of Wyoming. That's where she currently is and has been there since 2000, I think. Um, and she's also currently the editor of Wildlife Monographs, so keeping busy. Um, if those two tasks weren't keeping her busy enough, um, she also has served as the chair of the zoology department and the director of their ecology program, much like the ecology program that's hosting her now. And um, she, as, as many of you know, and I think we'll hear about maybe a little today or tomorrow or both, um, she was a recent candidate for US Senate in Wyoming. And so it's been really fun. Uh, my lab got to meet with her earlier today and she's really fun. If you haven't had a chance, there are still opportunities, I'm sure, to sign up if you're in the Ecology Center tomorrow. And don't forget the other opportunity is tonight, right after this, everybody should head over to the Student Center, go up to the Sky Room and have a social with her. All right, here you go. Thanks everybody. It's a pleasure to be in Logan again. People keep asking me if I've ever been here before and the truth of the matter is that I have on various occasion, including to give a seminar here back in early 2000 when I collaborated with Jim Hafner on some evolutionary um, <clears throat> genetics projects. So it's a pleasure being here again. I'm glad the rain stopped and we could see some sun. Um, I don't know how long I would have been able to send, withstand the rain. <laughs> um, I'm going to tell you a story about a button. And the title of my talk is um, Who Pushed the Button? And it goes from turtle science, real science, into why and how I ran for the US Senate last year. You're looking at the North Pole over time. And your system is not working very really well. There it goes. It's supposed to be smooth, but we'll take what we get, right? Note that the sea ice seasonally refreezes in winter and thaws out in summer. And this is what we have seen in the last few decades, a severe decline in the extent of sea ice in the Arctic Ocean. And if you are like me studying polar bears, this is, what you monitor every morning with your morning coffee. <clears throat> no, I need the other one too. <laughs> I need to have two. <clears throat> this is reconstruction of September sea ice. Sea ice is at the lowest extent in September. This is reconstruction from uh, ice cores in the Arctic basin. And this is the satellite record. So when you study polar bears, you're really interested in body condition. And we all know from our own personal experiences that body condition is a function of energy intake, energy intake minus energy expenditure. And if you ever looked online, I don't know if you have, um, you will find out that the best way to lose weight, what most of the uh, expert recommend is do a treadmill workout. That will burn most of the calories that you ingest. Might be easier to do it this way. Okay. So when you are human, our goal is to reduce our body condition because we have susceptibility to several diseases associated with overweight. Uh, diabetes, uh, heart condition, uh, a few others. But 
Um, in polar bears, it's actually the opposite. Polar bears, for polar bears, they need to maximize their body condition. For polar bear, good body condition looks like this. So really polar bears not need to increase the energy intake and decrease the energy expenditure. So how do polar bears increase energy intake? Polar bears are ambush hunters. They spend most of their time waiting, just like this guy here, in front of a seal breathing hole. And when the seal comes up for a breath of air, the polar bear pounces on it. And this is what the end result looks like. The main prey of polar bears is ringed seals. They compose up to 80% of the diet. Some bears, especially the large males, may can sometimes uh, catch and feed on bearded seals and sometimes even beluga whales. And in the Chukchi Sea, uh, walruses are a big uh, prey item, especially the larger uh, individuals for males. Next. Um, polar bears, so just to give you an idea, this is a ring seal. Um, this is a bearded seal. Bearded seals are much, much bigger than ring seals. And polar bears, 10 adult non-breeding polar bears, non-pregnant and lactating polar bears usually tend to eat mostly the blubber, um, basically because they want to increase their body condition. They don't bother with the protein. Uh, a lot of times you'll find these carcasses on the ice. And what you'll see is that juvenile polar bears um, follow the adults that make the kill and eat the blubber. And they consume the rest of the carcass because juvenile polar bears, independent bears are not as good as catching, at catching seals as the adults, but also uh, they need protein to grow. So they make, take uh, advantage of this. And you'll also see a lot of Arctic foxes, sometimes all the way near the North Pole, which is incredible. Um, <clears throat> this is by the way, what the polar bears uh, uh, wet dream is, a seal coming up the hole. Next, oh, before you go next, uh, go back. Uh, colleagues of mine, uh, Sterling, Ian Sterling and Orsland, back in 1995, uh, estimated based on kill rates, they followed polar bears and they looked at how many uh, seals a population of polar bears killed. They estimated that an adult polar bears uh, need to catch a year 29 seals. Uh, if they only eat the blah bear, they'll need 36 of them. Okay, keep that number in mind. We'll get back to it later. Next. What you'll see when you study seals um, is that seals are mostly available to polar bears during April, May, and June of every year, a little bit into July. In April, May, and June, uh, ringed seals especially, and also bearded seals, uh, have their pups. And so they're tied to specific locations on the ice that they can uh, leave the pup in a den. I'll show you a picture in a minute. And then the mother comes in and nurses the pup while um, um, uh, not foraging. And shortly thereafter, they, all adults, males and females, stay on the ice and molt. They like our dogs. They change the fur every year. Uh, so in July, what you see mainly are molting seals. When they molt, they don't like to jump in the water because it's so cold and the fur provides some insulation in addition to the blubber. So seals are more available in July. So keep in mind that April, May, June, and July are the main months where polar bears can increase or actually even have energy intake. That's why they need to get so fat because then they have to go through the whole summer where uh, they can't get many seals, they're not available. And uh, in the winter, when the ice returns and seals uh, can, the polar bear can reach them, uh, they don't hold, the seals don't hold out because the water is warmer than the, uh, the air over the ice. So April, May, June, July are the feeding months for polar bears. Next, uh, to show you what, uh, ring seal den looks like. 
Here is the mother's breeding hole. She creates a little cave in the snow above the ice, and she gives birth to a very tiny, cute uh, seal pup. This is what a, such a layer, we call them, look like when a polar bear pounced on it. And this is what happens when the polar bear gets the pup. Usually they don't actually eat the pups. They wait for the mother to come to nurse the pup, and then they pounce and get both of them and eat the mother. And the Arctic foxes eat the pup. Next. Turns out that seals are also restricted in their movements, not just seasonally available, but also spatially. Uh, the Arctic Ocean is extremely deep. It's about 3,000 meters deep. And uh, there is very little light entering the ocean, very little productivity. And most of the life in Arctic Ocean happens on the continental shelf. This is where productivity is. This is where fish are. This is where seals are. And this is where polar bears can get seals. So if there is no ice over the continental shelf, even in spring, there will be no seals and there will be no food for polar bears. Next. Every time I give this talk, people immediately imagine the Arctic Ocean as this immense expense of solid ice. This is not true. It has never been true in the entire history of ice in the Arctic Ocean. What really ice in the Arctic Ocean looks like is the following. Basically, you have big, big plates of solid ice that is broken, sometimes with big, um, 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 the word escaped me, but um, big breaks in the ice. Sometimes you have expenses of, of open water with, with icebergs on them. This is how the ice has always been in the Arctic. Next. Um, basically, like any other ocean, the Arctic Ocean has currents, tides, and wind. And all of these move this big body of water around. I'll show you an illustration in a minute. And that movement breaks the big chunks of ice into um, uh, pans, some of them large, some of them small. The word I was looking for was leads. And so there are always chunks of ice that drift and move in the Arctic Ocean. Now to watch this, we will, and actually end up, can I have the mouse for a second? Thank you. Because uh, that somehow does not want, oops. Escape, play this. Should have used my laptop. <laughs> okay, tomorrow we will do open. Thank you. <laughs> what? It doesn't want to play it. Let's do my laptop. Yeah. You guys mind if we take five, let's in five minutes and set it up through my laptop? Because you need to see this and the other videos. <clears throat> Let me turn it on before we hook it up. I was telling Greg, um, that when I interviewed for the University of Wyoming 22 years ago, I came with a PowerPoint with um, cool pictures. I put a lot of work into that presentation. I got to the University of Wyoming and they had absolutely no capabilities to play my job talk. So here I am, uh, completely stressed out, right? I want this job. And I'm standing there and all of them are looking at me like, uh, who are you and what did you bring here? 
And, you know, so I have a conversation with them like I'm having with you now. And I got it to, um, we don't want everybody to see all my secrets. <laughs> yeah, it will work. Uh, Can you undo this? Mm -hmm. Stop the recording. Oh, we won't be able to record. Never mind. Um, we should still be able to record. So. All right. Okay. Close the presentation okay. and eject my hard drive. Don't say it. Close this. Eject. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so it took half an hour for them at Wyoming to um, get something to work. They rolled in a cart with a big old projector and they hooked it up to my laptop. And I gave my talk. And <clears throat> left town and knew that I blew it. I'm not going to get that job, you know. And then two days later, I get a phone call and they said, oh, we would like to offer you the job. And I'm like, Phew. I said, you know why you got the job? You got the job, not because of your amazing presentation. It was amazing. Uh, not because of your wonderful personal interactions with all of us. You got a job because you didn't lose your cool for half an hour while we got your presentation going. If you could handle that in a job talk, your hours, so, and that's where I've been for the last 20 years. So there you have it. Uh, now we are gonna. Now we can connect HDMI. And you can. In here, okay, that's right. You guys see it? Okay, what you're looking at is, is that the, okay, see if it works. What you're seeing is another illustration of the freezing and thawing of sea ice and seasonal uh, changes. And also what you see, and I'd like you to pay attention to, is the fact that the ice is always moving. Okay, uh, white is uh, multi-year ice, good ice, high quality polar bear habitat. The blue ice is seasonal uh, annual ice, not so good for polar bears and, and seals. And what you see is what the ice is doing is moving from the Canadian high Arctic along the Alaskan coast towards Russia. This is right here is what we call the Beaufort gyre. It's a major, um, uh, transport of ice in Arctic, I'll play it again, just because now we have control over the system. And so again, you're looking at the North Pole, uh, blue is seasonal ice, this is the high quality ice. Notice how little of it is left nowadays. You see in the early 1990s, there was a lot of old good high ice uh, and now we are losing it every year. And again, this is the Beaufort Gyre. The Beaufort Gyre is basically taking ice that is formed near Banks Island in Canadian High Arctic, and then transporting from east to west, from Canada to Russia along the Alaska, Alaskan coast.
2012 was the worst year in the Arctic. <clears throat> and it hasn't been much better since. Okay. Yeah, that's working. Nice. Got it. Okay. When you look at polar bears and look at the movement patterns, what you see is that they show high fidelity to what we call a subpopulation. So here you're looking at the Chukchi Sea. If you looked at 50% uh, of all bears in a Chukchi Sea, 50% of the time they'll be in this area. Uh, no, that's not working. Okay. They'll be, this is the 50% core habitat of uh, or home range of Chukchi, bear, Chukchi Sea polo bears. Uh, this is the southern Beaufort population. 50% of the time you'll find the southern Beaufort Sea polo bears here. And this is the uh, northern Beaufort Sea. Most of the time that subpopulation bears will be here. Polar bears show very, very high fidelity to their subpopulation. We actually had a, a female polar bear walk from here all the way around to Greenland and came back within months. They show high fidelity to their subpopulation. We don't know why. But what it means, think about Beaufort Gyre moving from east to west along the uh, Alaskan coast, basically moving from here to here. For bears to stay in their subpopulation all the time, what do they need to do? They need to walk. They need to walk. The ice goes east to west, the bears goes west to east. Treadmill. They're walking on a constant treadmill. As you saw in the illustration, sea ice is disappearing. Uh, the last 12 years have been the worst sea ice conditions. This is the median, the 75% quant quantiles of sea ice extent. This is the 95. These are just some of the last 12 years. We are way below. Here it is in another graphical form. You see the decline. This is true not just for summer. This is true in winter, the same trend line. We are losing ice. Not only are we losing ice, as you saw in the previous uh, illustration, we are losing the high quality multi-year thick ice. Uh, here is a dis uh, distribution of ice in 1984 as an example compared to last year. There is no red. Red is multi-year ice. This is what it looks like. Well, it turns out that um, when you have younger and thinner ice, it drifts on top of the ocean currents and because of the wind action faster. So the question is, what does that do to body condition of polar bears? Remember the best way to lose calories is doing a treadmill exercise and somebody, us, have been pushing the button. You. Ah, it took time to load. Let's quickly take a quick look at how we study polar bears or how we used to when they let us catch them. It is. There we go. Sometimes we use icebreakers to get up north. Many times we capture polar bears from uh, bases along the Arctic shoreline. We use helicopters and we fly over the ice looking for polar bears tracks. We follow their tracks until we find the bear. You'll see in a minute, here are tracks. We follow the tracks until we reach the polar bear. 
And then while the helicopter hanging uh, halfway out the window, we shoot them with a dart. We use tilazole, we sedate them, the mother and the cubs, and then we uh, collect samples. We mark them with uh, tattoos, ear, ear uh, tags. We collect all kinds of biological samples, including breath, blood, uh, hair. Um, and then we put a GPS collar on them and we slide the collar on to their necks. So if they are unhappy with the collar, they can shuck it. And some of them do. You can imagine we collected a lot of data points. The white points are where we actually captured the polar bears. And these are the Southern Beaufort Sea and the Chukchi Sea bears. We ended up not using the data for the Eastern Northern Beaufort Sea. You can see we have a, a lot of data points. Um, and basically we use these data to uh, evaluate how much the bears are walking on this ice treadmill. One thing that is important to note, unlike when you track um, elk or moose or chipmunks, is that you have to correct the, tra the telemetry track for the ice movement. So we got the ice movement vectors, how fast and what direction. And here is the bo that Beaufort gyre. I told you it's a major ice exporter in the Arctic. Um, you take the uh, bear movements, the telemetry track, which is in gray, correct it for the ice movement, the blue, to get the actual bear movements, okay? Um, <clears throat> we did that for two time periods. Uh, the one is what we call the early satellite era from 87 to 98. Uh, and then the later season, 99 to 2013. And we, Chose 98 as a breakoff point because that's what the uh, oceanographers uh, determined was the switch, the regime shift in the Arctic in terms of ice uh, behavior. And that's why we chose this as a break point. What you see here is the ice movement in the Beaufort Sea and the Chukchi Sea. Uh, the rate is in kilometers per day. The solid bars are the early period and the same uh, color, but light shading is the later period. This is ice movement. And you see that ice is drifting faster. And as a, a result, polar bears tracks, the telemetry track is longer or faster. And then when you correct it for the ice movement, you still get the same response. Polar bears are moving more per day, okay? It's faster, but it's more per day. But that's not the whole story because that was overall movement. So you have to put it in the context of the Beaufort Gyre that goes from east to west and the bears have to walk from west to east. So here is the east-west, the easting. And <clears throat> again, you have the ice movement, the ice drift this way and the bell movements this way, okay? And that was the early period, the solid bars and here are the shaded ones. And what you see is that bells always had to walk against the ice drift, but not every month, okay? So you have uh, December, uh, January, February, March, April, May, June. They had to walk more. July, not so bad. In fact, July is a big uh, month where polar bears can invest in feeding. Um, and um, in a more recent period, the difference is significant in all months and it is larger. We pushed the button on the treadmill. And so what, what does that mean? We developed an energetics model and we used what we knew about 
Polar bears walking on a treadmill, believe it or not, people have walked polar bears on a treadmill. Here is a treadmill and a polar bear walking on a treadmill. Um, <clears throat> and we used resting metabolic rate and a few speeds to develop this relationship. And based on this relationship, we estimated what is happening to polar bears in the wild. After we were done with our work, our colleague uh, Anthony Pagana re repeated the treadmill experiment. This is actually his data. And luckily for us, his estimates came exactly on top of the older ones and our model. So we had validation. Um, I'm not going to go into the super duper details of the model. I'm just going to show you some highlights. And the first one is that an adult uh, polar bear active a certain amount of time walking at a certain speed will have this energy expenditure to meet this energy need they'll need to uh, capture uh, eat 30 adult seals or 37 if they only ate the blubber remember the 99 95 study by uh, sterling and Orisland? Uh, i don't think that's significantly different so this is a good validation of the model uh, adult with one cub or two cubs, a little bit more. The real kicker is for adults trying to raise two yearlings, um, they really have to more than double their seal capture success. That was, and now some differences between the Beaufort and the Chukchi Sea. This is the early period. This is the late period now that the treadmill is moving faster. And it increases the number of seals that a female polar bear has to catch by four at a minimum. If you wanna know why at a minimum, I can tell you later. So when you look at sea ice and you look at adult survival, no effect. Why? Okay, so she needs to catch two more seals to feed herself. That's nothing. She can catch 77 seals to feed two yearlings. Adults are not yet really severely affected by the fact that the ice is drifting faster. But can you imagine trying to catch 81 seals in a very small time period over the continental shelf? Not only that, they have to spend nine to 13% more of their time walking, which means less time sitting ambushing seal holes. So not only they expend more energy, they have less time to hunt seals. But that's not the whole story because it turns out that with um, diminishing, diminishing sea ice and lengthening of the ice melt period, um, they have to swim more. And polar bears are excellent swimmers. They're really good swimmers, but they have to swim a lot more. And so, and it takes a while because there is another video. Yes. Um, okay. So please watch, this is a bear that we put a GPS on and we caught her at Point Lonely in, uh, on the Alaskan coast, not far from Puerto Bay. And after two days on sitting down and waiting, uh, she started swimming and she disappeared. We didn't get any satellite uh, response from her. We thought she chucked the collar and it fell into the bottom of the ocean, which they do. Um, but then suddenly she popped up. She popped up 11 days later. So this is a bear that swam from the coast to the edge of the, of the ice 11 days straight. No rest, no feeding, no drinking, no sleeping, nothing. She swam 11 days, made it to the sea ice. And I'll play this video again. Um, by the way, this bear is in the... Guinness Book of Records. Uh, she made it in. So here she is living point uh, lonely. These are uh, GPS locations. 
she made it to the, she stayed on a little iceberg after nine days. And then after a couple hours, she continued swimming, made it to the ice edge and rested for a long time. Um, then she uh, started going uh, back south with the reforming ice. Uh, she went down and she was going to Canada and we went, oh my God, no way. We were in Prudhoe Bay at the time. And I said, we have to catch this bear. We have to get this GPS collar back. I don't care. And we mounted a massive operation, packed all our lab, packed everything, chartered the plane, flew to Kaktovik, set up camp. And I was on the phone with the Canadian government and our state department and every local community in the Yukon and, and Alaska territories getting permission for us if we need to cross the border to do so and catch her and get the, the collar off. And at the very, very last minute, she landed on the US side of the border. <laughs> and we were able to fly a helicopter, catch her, get the collar, and that's why we have such a full track. But that was an indication for us that if we lost contact with a bear, it doesn't mean that the collar is gone or that the bear died. It means that maybe they're swimming. So my our colleague, uh, Anthony Pagano, uh, took a look at that data. And, and if we can move over one slide. Um, yeah, turns out that polar bears swim more. Not the short distance swimmers, but long distance, long distance, hundreds of kilometers swims. And when? Nowadays. So swimming costs a lot more than walking. So what does that mean? It means that polar bear body condition is declining. And we see more and more and more of these bears that are maybe medium sized body condition, medium body condition to actually animals that are starving. We find that younger polar bears have reduced skull size, reduced body length, uh, cub size at birth is smaller and cub survival is minimal. Of all the polar bear cubs that I got to hold or sample or whatever, only two survived to two-year-olds and none survived to adulthood. And that translates to declining populations. Unfortunately, the last analysis that was done uh, in Canada and the US ended in 2010. Guys, that's 11 years ago, uh, polar bear populations are still declining. Not in all parts of the range, because in the Canadian high Arctic, we still have good polar bear habitat, but in many, many subpopulations, we see severe population effects. So what should we do? Well, my colleagues uh, did a very massive and interesting uh, modeling exercise of what will happen to sea ice. If we don't do anything, we're gonna not have sea ice. And we don't have sea ice, we don't have polar bears. But if we meet the Paris Climate Accord commitments, which were made for 2020, hello, that was last year. We may not recover sea ice for a long time, but we can at least reduce its decline. We, stay, we can stabilize it. Now we are long past these commitments. 2020 was last year, that was a pandemic year, right? And, um, um, and we overshot it by a lot. And that is what pushed my button. This is a picture of me right there, the captain of the Polo Sea, that icebreaker we used. This is Greg Marshall from National Geographic, the video you saw National Geographic, that's his. It's October 31st, Halloween, 2009. 
not even the worst sea ice year in the Arctic. Remember the last 12 years, the ice was the worst? Halloween. The polar sea is cruising at nine knots. We are near the North Pole. We're in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. Am I wearing a hat? No. Am I wearing gloves? No. Am I zipping my coat? No. So while we're talking about one and a half degrees warming, globally, the Arctic has warmed seven and a half degrees centigrade so far. And this year, in the Laptive Sea, this year, near Angel Island, Siberia, the temperatures were warmer than they were in Logan, Utah. Today, I have a hat in my coat, and I was considering wearing it a couple of times, walking in between buildings. It's warmer in the Arctic now than it is in Logan, Utah. That pushed my button. And why should you care? Why should anybody care? I don't care about polar bears. What do I care about polar bears? I want to know about Britney Spears' husband or father or whatever it was, <laughs> right? We need to care because we are humans. And it's not polar bears that are at risk. We are at risk. We know about hurricanes, flooding. Did you see the flooding in Germany? Did you see the flooding in China? Did you see the flooding in Turkey? Did you see the flooding in Tel Aviv? I bet you didn't. But you have seen the smoke. We are getting more extreme fires most frequently. This is my favorite picture of the fire right south of Laramie, the Moulin fire, the largest fire in Yellowstone, in Wyoming's history since the 1998, 1988 fires in Yellowstone. I couldn't breathe. It was a huge fire. So we need to care because we are at risk. But also because we care about nature. And what climate crisis is doing is it increases human migrations. Starving people are not going to sit there and watch their kids die, as they unfortunately are doing right now in Mad Madagascar, if they can walk. And do we have an immigration problem on the southern border? Sure we do. Who are these people? They are climate migrants. Is that stupid wall going to stop them? Not if they're dying. Not if they're dying. And what do people on the move eat? They eat wildlife. So if we have 1 million species under risk of extinction right now, what is it going to be in two years? So what did I do? I have been a member of these organizations and many, many more. I think I donate half of my salary to all kinds of organization every year. Uh, from very local ones, like the Southeast Alaska Conservation uh, Council, Q350, um, from the Sierra Club to uh, WWF to Wyoming Outdoor Council, local and global organizations. I also joined a lobbying group, a grassroots organization called the Citizens Climate Lobby, 
Uh, it's a group that started from a guy, an economist in California, who looked at the Alaska Permanent Fund dividend um, program and said, hey, we can do this with fossil fuels. Let's put a tax on fossil fuels based on per ton of carbon released to the atmosphere potential for each uh, amount of, uh, um, you know, oil, gas, and coal extracted. Put a fee on it collect all the fee through the IRS, and then divide the revenue just from this program among all citizens of the United States. Not all citizens, all residents, including newborn kids. Everybody gets the same amount dividend, divided equally as it is in the Alaska Permanent Fund dividend. And that one small group grew into now having over 600 active um, Chapters, I, I'm a member of the um, Laramie chapter. We have several chapters in Wyoming. I'm sure you guys have quite a few chapters. In fact, one of the uh, leaders of the Western region lives in Salt Lake, a really nice guy. Uh, he actually ran for Congress a few years ago here and didn't get it. But um, the last Congress, they introduced House Resolution 763, which is the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, which has bipartisan support. Okay. Citizen Climate Lobby um, lobbies Congress. We've learned, we have been trained, are being trained. There is a big uh, training session this weekend, both Saturday and Sunday. Uh, visit the website and you can guys get uh, to see. Um, what, what the agenda is and you can join, it's free. No donations needed. Um, the idea is that this Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act um, will reduce uh, carbon emissions uh, by 40% over the next 12 years. Actually, this was last in 2019, so now we're talking about 10 years, if the law passes. And I've been very active in the group, still am. And then I realized that it's not enough. Because even when you look at senators like Sheldon Whitehouse, who's a big proponent of both um, HL 763 and also is a big uh, advocate for climate action. Every Wednesday night, he would stand on the Senate floor and give an hour and a half presentation on the effects of climate change on Utah on the ski industry, on hydrology. He had a whole segment on Wyoming. Nobody listens to him. Nobody knows about these presentations. When he sits at a table, uh, people ignore him because what does he know? Can you imagine someone like me sitting in a White House at the negotiation table, talking about climate change and the effects of climate with what I bring to the table and tell me no. Sitting across Joe Manchin. Can you imagine him telling me, I don't care about climate change? I want to see that. I wanted to see that, which is why when uh, Senator Mike Enzi announced he was retiring in 2019, I announced my candidacy to the US Senate. Um, and learned a lot. Uh, I learned that you need to raise a lot of money, a lot of money. Look, I wrote huge grants, that icebreaker, that was NSF funding and we wrote the grant and it was $42,500 a day, 36 days cruise in Arctic Ocean. It was huge. I raised money before. I thought I knew how to raise money, but no, it's different kind of money raising. So I'll, I'll share a bit what it involves. Uh, you need to get endorsements because they lead to money um, and you need infrastructure. You need people like Kay Glad who has done uh, organizing for elections for years. 
and knows how to build a network of people who will help you and get to all the voters. You can't call, even though Wyoming has very few voters compared to the rest of the country, still thousands and thousands of people. You can't call all of them. So you need people to work with you. Um, and then you need to take your message and make it engaging and relevant. What I've learned is that running for office, you need to have experience and expertise, at least helping you. Um, we couldn't have events because it was, hey, COVID, right? Um, so a lot of it was emails, phone calls, social media, and endorsements. And we raised more than half a million dollars doing that. A few statistics. Um, we raised, so this was Act Blue, people donating online. We got the rest was people sending checks. People, not all people are comfortable donating online. Um, the average total contribution was 18 bucks. We had 26,000, well, actually, the total with the checks was 28,000 people donating to our campaign. 28,000 people committed to us. 25,000 of these people were first time donors to any political campaign. 25,000 have never paid attention to a political campaign and made a donation, donated to us. Got endorsement, of course, from the progressive part of the party. <laughs> I'm a progressive, I'll admit it. Um, Elizabeth Warren, I owe her a lot. She did a lot to make sure that we got money. She put us, our campaign on every one of our emails. Uh, when uh, Chief Dust Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed, it was a mega uh, freak out on the Democratic side. And she put out an email and said, if you're freaking out, donate to these campaigns and included us in it. And we got most of our Elizabeth Warren type donations from that email. Uh, so I owe her a big time. Uh, Ed Markey also endorsed us and of course then candidate Joe Biden endorsed our campaign. I got endorsements from, from several organizations including Sierra Club, Friends of the Earth and other environmental groups. The one fun thing is, you know what? Running a political campaign, you need to use data, a lot of data. The data is out there. You will be surprised what we know about you. Um, so you need somebody who can analyze data. There are programs that uh, are associated. You also need um, a team. I was lucky that a lot of young people, uh, here are some of the staff, and we had over 200 volunteers that uh, made phone calls, texts, emails, whatever. Uh, they were young people interested in pol politics and uh, communication. And because of COVID, they took a gap year and dedicated their entire time to working on political campaigns. Uh, many of these guys who worked for me after the election uh, switched to, uh, to Georgia and went from one campaign to another. And thanks to them, I also made phone calls for Georgia. Uh, we got two Democratic uh, senators that we wouldn't have otherwise. <clears throat> Again, a lot of <coughs> outreach and communication. Messaging is important. I'm going to quickly wrap up here so we have a couple minutes for questions. Um, what is important to me may not be important to the voters, so you need to listen, not just uh, tell them what you want. Um, then <coughs> you need to learn how to use a lot of the platforms out there. Facebook is terrible. Um, the key, the key is you have 10 seconds, 10 seconds to catch somebody's attention. So if you want to say something, make sure you can say it in 10 seconds hard for scientists that like to explain every uncertainty in any data point. Um, and you need to adjust the message um, because, you know, a primary is different than a... Uh, I 
I have to do this because this is silly. <laughs> this is my campaign manager. He was phenomenal um, uh, messaging expert. And he is the one who came with, you know, we need scientists in the US Senate. So science in the Senate was our main message. <clears throat> okay, okay. We saw that. Uh, another uh, important thing is debates and being able to stand up to the competition. This is from the televised PBS uh, primary debate, which was easy. And then uh, I went through who is now an insurrectionist senator, uh, Cynthia Lomas, who voted against the certification of the election results. And pff, let's not go there. Um, so should we all run for Senate office? Um, <laughs> hell yeah. <laughs> um, actually, very few, very few people um, that are scientists are in any political position of influence, which is ridiculous. Um, if you look at the lists, even Mark Kelly, uh, he's an astronaut. He has a science background, but he's not a scientist. Um, um, none of these, if you look at my publication record and this publication records, they have none. Uh, I do have a Google Scholar account. Um, most of them are nurses, doctors, physicians, not real scientists. Here's me right there. They called me zoologist. So no, you don't need to run for Senate. Not all of us need to do it. Um, what can you do? Keep on top of things, know what's happening because knowledge is power. Don't look at Britney Spears and whatever. You know what? Even the football game that we are all worked up about, it's not important. It's not important. Um, become active member of environmental groups. Yes, we're scientists, we're supposed to be objective, but we know what's happening. And we need to get the word out. Uh, write letter to the editors, post on social media, give public talks, educate the others. You know what? Now I'm an editor in chief of monographs. We ask you to create a blurb, 80 words and a figure. Why won't you put that in your local newspaper? Where's Amy? Amy, are you here? Hi, Amy. Interview with Amy. Have her create a two minute thing on you the public radio every morning. Get the word out. Call your legislatures. You know what? I pick up the phone and I call my senators and Liz Cheney and her staff know, hey, Milan, how, what's the weather in Laramie? I have an accent, it's easy to tell who I am. They know who I am. Sign petitions, join a group. Do you know that you have local Democratic Party meetings or Libertarian, I don't know, become part of it. I will take one evening of your month. You know what? Become a precinct person. That will take maybe two evenings of your month. And volunteer and donate to political campaigns. Do it. Um, politically, I have to thank the Wyoming Democratic Party. I love our logo. Um, a lot of uh, online personalities who really boosted my campaign, Charles Gerber, Thomas Keane, and We The People 2020. Uh, my dog participated in some campaign videos. He was a star. Uh, organizing director, campaign manager, all the volunteers, all the donors, everybody. And scientifically, I have to thank all my collaborators and PhD students, George, um, Eric, and John Whiteman, all our colleagues and helpers, the 
uh, um, helicopter pilots and all the undergraduates that work with us and got to hug polar bears, even undergrads. And he's now a warden in Green River. And of course the funding agencies, including NSF and um, you know, USGS, Fish and Wildlife Service, et cetera, and NASA. And with that, uh, me and the bear will take any questions.